Sutra, if these living beings have never accumulated any blessings, the first come ones of the ten directions will bestow their own merit and virtue upon this people. Commentary If these living beings who recite and uphold the Suragama mantra have never accumulated any, bless any blessings, they've never done any good deeds or earned any blessings, then the first come ones of the ten directions will bestow their own merit and virtue upon these people. Why do they do that? Because these people recite the Suragama mantra, or read it, copy it, or write it out. They have no blessings, but the Buddhas of the Ten Directions give them blessings. A real bargain, wouldn't you say? All one must do is recite the Suragama mantra. Sutra, because of that, throughout assemblages of ineffable, unspeakable numbers of compass, as many as the Ganges sense, they are always together with the Buddhas. They are born in the same place due to their limitless merit and virtue, and like the Amala fruit cluster, they stay in the same place, become permitted with cultivation, and are never parted. Commentary because of that, throughout the Asamkiryas of innumerable, unspeakable numbers of compas, as many as the Ganges sands, they are always together with the Buddhas. The Ganges sands indicates a large number. Asamkirya is also a large number. It means limitless number in Sanskrit. This refers to compas greater in number than could ever be expressed. They are born in the same place due to their limitless merit and virtue, and like the Amala fruit cluster, they stay in the same place, become permitted with cultivation, and are never parted. Born in the same place refers not so much to having the same birthplace as to being born in the same generation. That is, they are always born at a time when there is a Buddha in the world. We are born at a time when there is no Buddha in the world. This is one of the eight difficulties. The difficulty of being born before or after the time of a Buddha. Those who are born when a Buddha is in the world are endowed with limitless merit and virtue. The Amala fruit cluster has three fruits on one stem. The fruits themselves are as if three and yet as if one. They cannot be separated one from the other. So, to this people reside where the Buddha is and become infused with cultivation. They never have to be apart from the Buddha. Sutra. Therefore, it can enable those who have broken the precepts to regain the purity of the precept source. It can enable those who have not received the precepts to receive them. It can cause who those who are not vigorous to become vigorous. It can enable those who lack wisdom to gain wisdom. It can cause those who are not pure to quickly become pure. It can cause those who do not hold to vegetarianism to become vegetarians naturally. Commentary Therefore, it can enable those who have broken their precepts to regain the purity of the precept source. Even those who have broken the precepts can regain the precepts if they genuinely recite and uphold the Suragama Mantra every day. Basically, someone who has violated the precepts cannot be saved. But if that person recites the Suragama mantra is possible for them to regain the purity of the precepts. Reciting doesn't just mean a causal recitation. You have to obtain the samadhi of holding mantras, as I just described. Then the mantra wells up from your heart and returns to your heart. That's what's meant by the mantra heart, the heart of the mantra, the heart of the mantra, the mantra heart. The mantra and your heart become one. There's no distinction between them. You cannot forget it. It recites itself. You are not reciting it, but it is being recited. You are reciting it, but it is as if you were not. 
even if you don't want to recite it. It goes on being recited. Right now, we recite the mantra before the sutra lecture, but that's just a way of preparing the ground for you. It's just pointing out the way for all of you. It's certainly not that it's only appropriate to recite the mantra at lecture time. You can recite it anywhere at any time, to know it by heart and to recite to the point that all other false thoughts and scattered thoughts are wiped away and all that remains is your mind's recitation of the Suragama Mantra. That's what is called concentration. The recitation comes together and there are no other thoughts. It's like flowing water that goes on and on, coming from afar and rolling by in wave after wave. It's like the blowing wind which comes up invisibly but makes its presence known. The water flows, the wind blows, the proclaiming the Mahayana. The sounds of the water and wind speak the great Vihaku Dharma. They are all the hearts of the Suragama Mantra. When recitation reaches that state, it can enable those who have broken the precepts to regain the purity of the precept source. It can cause those who have not received the precepts to obtain them. It can cause those who are not vigorous to become vigorous. People who aren't inclined to progress, who don't investigate the Buddha Dharma, can spontaneously give rise to vigor from reciting the Suragama Mantra over a long period of time. It can enable those who lack wisdom to gain wisdom. Just look at this. It can enable stupid people to open their wisdom. It can cause those who are not pure to quickly become pure. If you cultivate and yet are not pure, if you violate the precepts, break the, pra the practice of pure eating and get muddled and unclear for a long time. Still, if you don't forget the Suragama Mantra, you can quickly gain purity. Once you want to change, you can very quickly return to purity. For instance, I know there are those among you here who would like to study the Buddha Dharma, but those bodies and minds, but whose bodies and minds are not pure. But it doesn't matter if you lack purity. It's just to be feared that you won't study, because if you study, the day will come when you suddenly become pure. You will soon understand. But if you don't study and you say, I don't want to become pure, I don't want to be vigorous, I like being lazy, I'd rather not knowing anything, then with that attitude, there's nothing that can be done for you. It can cause those who do not hold the to vegetarianism to become vegetarians naturally. If you recite the Suragama Mantra until it comes together, in a concentrated recitation, then the wind can't blow through and the rain can't penetrate. Then even if you don't hold to vegetarianism, you will automatically do so. Why? Because you won't have any false thoughts. You won't have any greed or desires. You won't be thinking about wanting to eat meat or fish or delicious foods. It won't enter your mind. Sutra Ananda, if a good man who upheld this mantra violated the pure precepts before they received the mantra, their multitude of offenses incurred by violating the precepts, whether major or minor, can simultaneously be eradicated after they begin to uphold the mantra. Commentary, this passage gives a clearer explanation Ananda, if good men who uphold this mantra violated the pure precepts before they received the mantra, if they uphold the mantra now but violated the pure precepts in the past, breaking them before they received them, their multitude of offenses incurred by violating the precepts, whether major or minor, can simultaneously be eradicated after they begin to uphold the mantra. All their offenses of breaking the practice of pure eating and of violating the precepts can be eradicated. Even the four Paratrika 
offenses. Barajika means called for dismissal, meaning that they cannot be repented of. But if you recite the Suragama Mantra, then all the offenses you have committed, no matter how serious, will be made clean. It is like pouring boiling water over snow. Sutra, even if they drank intoxicants or ate the five pungent plants and various other impure things in the past, the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Varas, Gods, Immortals, Ghosts, and Spirits will not hold it against them. Commentary The five pungent plants are leeks, garlic, shallots, scallions, and onions. These are the ones common to our area. Asafoetida, common in India and often found in curries, is another pungent plant included in this list. Since these hot pungent plants have unpleasant odors, they are prohibited in Buddhism for people who hold to pure eating practices. These are unclean kinds of things to eat and cause desire and anger. But even if they, the holders of the mantra, drank intoxicants or ate the five pungent plants and various other impure things in the past, the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Varas, Gods, Immortals, Ghosts and Spirits will not hold it against them. If you can constantly recite and uphold the Suragama Mantra, the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Dharma protectors will not blame you for your former impure habits. If they won't hold it against me, then I can use these things as I please. You may reason it's still be best not to use them. Sutra, if they are unclean and wear tattered old clothes to carry out the single practice and single dwelling, they can be equally pure. Even if they do not set up the platform, do not enter the Buddhimanda, or do not practice the way, but recite and uphold this mantra, their merit and virtue will be identical with that derived from entering the platform and practicing the way. Commentary If they are unclean and wear tattered old clothes, so carry out the single practice and single dwelling above. When the platform was described, the Buddha said that one should put on new clothes, but here he says one doesn't necessarily have to wear new clothes. If you don't have new clothes, old ones will do. When you go through the three weeks of practice, you can become pure just the same. Because of the power of the mantra, it makes no difference if the clothes you wear are new or old. The purity obtained is the same. You may wonder why he said to wear new clothes in the first place. We wear new clothes to signify our respect, out of utmost reverence and absolute purity. Even if they do not set up the platform, do not enter the Bodhimanda. You don't necessarily have to be inside the Bodhimanda. Any place at any time is a place of practice. If they do not practice the way, even if they don't cultivate but recite and uphold this mantra, that's all they are able to do in the way of practice. Their merit and virtue will be identical with that derived from answering the platform and practicing the way. If you can recite the Suragama Mantra, your merit and virtue are no different from one who can set up the platform and answer the Bodhimanda to practice the way. There is no distinction. Truly, the virtue of the Suragama Mantra is inconceivable. Sutra if they have committed the five rebellious acts, grave offenses, warranting an intermittent retribution, or if they are bishus or bishunis who have violated the four parajikas or the eight parajikas, such heavy karma as this will disperse after they recite this mantra like a sand dune that is scattered in a gill so that not a particle remains. Commentary If they have committed the five rebellious acts, grave offenses, warranting 
and intermittent retribution, the five rebellious acts are the most serious offenses in all of Buddhism. They are killing one's mother, killing one's father, killing an ahad, causing schism in the harmonious saha, shedding the Buddha's blood. If you deliberately injure the Buddha's body with a knife, or some such weapon, or if in some other way you draw blood on the Buddha's body, you have committed this offense. I have never even encountered a Buddha. The Buddha left the world, so I have no chance of committing this offense, you say. Not so, because to deface the Buddha image or break it is also called shedding the Buddha's blood. Even prints and paintings of Buddhas are included in this to destroy images of the Buddha when he is not in the world is also included in this offense. An interrupted retribution refers to the consequence of these offenses. Committing the ten evils brings a bad retribution, but committing the five rebellious acts results in a more severe punishment. If you commit the five rebellious acts, you will certainly fall into the relentless hell. This hell has been described before. It's full whether there is one person in it or many people in it. Therefore, it is also called unspaced since there is no space in it. It's called unintermittent because the suffering never slacks off even for, this, for a second, nor does it ever end. It goes on in the mindably. If there are bishops or bishonis who have violated the four parajitkas or the eight parajitkas, bishu has three meanings mendicant, frightener of Mara, destroyer of evil. A bishuni is a female member of the Sangha. The four parajitkas are sexual misconduct. Killing, stealing, make false claims. These are the four fundamental precepts. Parajikas in Sanskrit causes four dismissal in English. If you commit any of these four, then you are dismissed from the Sangha of Buddhism. You are cast out of the great sea of the Buddha Dharma, and you cannot re enter. The four parajikas are four bishus. Bishonis have eight parajikas, they include the four for the bishus plus touching the eight things, covering, not following. The parajikas offense of touching is described in the Vinaya as making contact with a woman while harboring thoughts of sexual desire. So whether it be a man, a woman, a bishu, or a bishuni, or a lay person, Physical contact between people when there are thoughts of sexual desire is a violation. If one does not have thoughts of sexual desire, there is no violation of the precepts. The parajika of the eight things, a Vishuni must always be in an open public place when she converses. She cannot go to a concealed place to talk or in a room where she would be alone with a man. In general, a man and woman alone cannot be alone together, be they Bishuni or Bishu. For a Bishu, this is a lighter offense. For a Bishuni, it is a heavy one. It is, it is forbidden that a Bishuni talk alone with a man. Covering means concealing another's offenses. You hide someone else's grave offenses, and are frank and open about them. You don't tell anyone. That's also a parajika offense for Bishunis. Not following refers to the recitation of precepts which takes place twice a month on the 1st and 15th of the lunar calendar. When Bishus are present in a place where Bishunis are, the Bishunis must follow along with the recitation of the precepts by the Bishus. They cannot recite the precepts themselves and take personal offerings. If they don't accord with this method, they violate this precept of not following. 
these are the eight biologic cars for visual needs. But even for people who have committed such serious violations, such heavy karma as this will dispose after they recite this mantra, like a sand dune that is scattered in a gale, so that not a particle remains. Even the five rebellious acts and the four and eight parajikas can be blown away by the recitation of the mantra, just as a strong wind blows away a sand dune so that it totally disappears. Not a hair's breadth of offense remains. This again shows the inconceivable power of the Suragama Mantra. Sutra Ananda, if living beings who have never repented and reformed any of the obstructive offenses, either heavy or light, that they have committed throughout countless compass past up to and including those of this very life, can nevertheless read, recite, copy, or write out this mantra or wear it on their bodies or place it in their homes or in their garden houses, then all that accumulated karma will melt away like snow in hot water. Before long, they will obtain awakening to patience with the non-production of dharmas. Commentary Ananda if living beings who have never repented and reformed any of the obstructive offenses, either heavy or light, that they have committed throughout Kali's compass past, up to and including those of this very life, they have never had an opportunity to repent of them and reform. Repent means to be sorry about one's former offenses. Reform means to change so one does not commit the errors again. They can nevertheless read the Suragama Mantra or recite it, copy it out or write it out. Reciting of the mantra must be done over a long term. The Buddha isn't talking about reciting it once or twice. It means over and over for a very long term. Or they wear it on their bodies when you call the mantra on your body you want to wear it above your heart, not below. To wear it above your heart represents respect. If you carry it on the lower part of your body, you are not showing proper respect for the mantra. Not only is there, there no merit in that, you are actually committing offenses. If you are not respectful to the mantra itself, then the efficacy of the mantra is depleted with regard to you or they place it in their homes or in their garden houses. Then all that accumulated karma from the offenses committed in life after life, as mentioned above, will melt away like snow in hot water. The offenses will disappear just that quickly. Before long, they will attain awakening to patience with the non-production of dharmas.